Victory would mean a first ever Australian appearance in the World Cup finals. Ray Richards came up to take the penalty. Booted it high to midfielder Rooney, who chipped it back for Jimmy Mackay. He came from 35 metres out and sent a perfectly timed kick right into the net. Naturally, the Australians were elated. After a two-all draw in Seoul and a nil-all draw in Sydney, they could sense victory. I think in our hearts we knew it was our... it was our... our night. Korea tried to fight back, though. With victory slipping away from them, they put in a last-ditch effort to get back into the game. For a few minutes, it seemed that Australia might bolt under the pressure. The Australians found that extra something and staved off the Korean attack. The final bell. Australia won the match 1-0. After the game, they celebrated with champagne until the early hours of the morning. They return to Sydney tomorrow morning and will probably get a hero's reception. The impact was amazing. Special issues of newspapers and everything. From the time we qualified in November of 1973 until the kickoff of the World Cup in Germany, saturation football in all the press. It was a big opportunity because it was for the first time that because Australia was in the World Cup that the sports fans suddenly, oh, we're in the World Cup, we're going to be interested, yeah? They're interested in Australia playing. And the Australian team's always been a great marketing PR vehicle because people follow Australia. They mightn't follow uh, the Cobb teams, but when Australia plays, they were interested. And this was Australia, a part-time team playing on the world stage against the greats of the world in a great event in Germany, a real football country, and people were interested. Australia was drawn in a tough group, playing East Germany, West Germany, and Chile. Out it goes to Johnny Warren for Mitchusenovich, picked up by Manfred Shaver, back to Warren on the right. Warren to Rooney, now the Australians looking a little more confident. For Johnny was, was hard because he, he broke a, a bone in his foot in, in the first game. John Warren is hot there, he got a very bad knock on the knee, I hope it's not his bad one. But he seems to be all right again. He, he just carried on playing all the time. He, he wouldn't say, you know, you know, the damage, and he used to go through pain like that. But then obviously he couldn't play after that, you know, and, and that was shattering. He missed West Germany, and West Germany was his sort of desire to line up against Beckenbauer, against Overath, against um, Gerd Miller, uh, Sepp Meyer, <laughs> you know. But he was not even included into any kind of selection against West Germany at all because he was definitely injured. Sadly for us, the Germans came, West Germany came out and had one of their, their better games, you know. It was 3-0, which Overart scored, great goal, long distance. Uh, Muller, the typical Muller, just to deflect in off the first post. And, but, but uh, I mean, that was, I mean, it was <laughs> to play against West Germany of Beckenbauer and one of the great teams of world football for the boys to play against them. Muller, Meyer, uh, Bar uh, Breitner, Overart, Netzer. You know, it was, a, by, even by German standards, a great team. The ruthless West Germans went on to win the tournament, but for the Socceroos, it had been a memorable taste of the world game on the biggest stage of all. After the World Cup, and in the twilight of his career, Johnny Warren returned to his club St George as player coach. In the first season under his leadership, the team came from near the bottom of the league to make the grand final, where they faced Hakoa. Yes, one of the old favourite skills of John Warren, a feint to shoot and then dragging it forward. That time he didn't get away with it. Johnny uh, scored this unbelievably uh, explosive individualist goal where he mesmerized the defense and then when he when he just had the goalkeeper to beat he just casually arrogantly with the outside of his right foot flicked it into the far corner
don't think he's probably scored a finer goal than that in the whole of his career. A great goal for John Warren, beating and then immediately substituted himself. And I sensed sitting in the in the stand that there was some kind of dramatic significance to this moment. Why would he substitute himself immediately after, immediately after scoring one of the most memorable goals of his career? And it was. He announced uh, that day that he was retiring from the game. It was a spontaneous decision, there and then, because he didn't know it was going to happen. That, I mean, him scoring the winning goal, and um, yeah. So he thought that's how quick-minded uh, he was. Johnny had a great sense of, of the grand occasion. He had his gift for knowing what is theatre and what is not. After leaving St George, Johnny wanted to witness firsthand the passion that football drives in other cultures. He decided to take his nephew Jamie to the land where football is everything. He wanted to go to South America to see, you know, why they are so good. Why, why has Brazil won, you know, so many World Cups? How do they do it? Definitely he has something for South American people and it wasn't just the football, of course, was a huge thing about it. But I think that it was the fact that we have that lively sort of uh, spirit and we enjoy music and drums and food and friends and noise and, and carnivals and things like that. Over there, people won't have anything to eat tomorrow, perhaps just some boiled rice, but there will be a ticket to go to the soccer match tonight. And that for him will be just amazing. Johnny's adoration of South America was reciprocated. He was made an honorary citizen of Brazil and built lifelong friendships with some of the biggest names in football. I'll be waiting for you to visit us in Brazil. I know you love barbecue, you love our country, you love our soccer. Please be our guest and may God be with you. His experience in Brazil confirmed to Johnny that the future of football was dependent on inspiring kids to play the beautiful game. To do this, he needed a platform. And with the emergence of SBS television in the early 80s, he got it. Captain, Captain, Captain Socceroo We'll show you things you've never seen And soccer tricks to do For Captain Socceroo Hello and welcome to our new Captain Socceroo series, a series in which we hope to improve the knowledge of junior players, coaches, teachers, parents and soccer fans in the world's greatest game. When he got the job to host Captain Socceroo, he was the ideal, ideal choice because uh, he, even though he was seen as some kind of football intellectual, uh, he had a very good link with kids. Kids admired Johnny Warren. I remember uh, when I was a kid uh, watching, running home from school to watch uh, Captain Socceroo and uh, it was all my, always my favourite program. But it was as a panellist on SBS that he could really preach his often outspoken vision for the game. Australian football was going nowhere in the late 80s and the middle of the 90s. Someone had to call it like it was, a whistleblower. It was my job to blow the whistle but I could not have done it for more than a week without the credibility of the guy sitting next to me. I don't like it, people who want to say when they're going to play, when they're not going to play. A polite way of saying he's been sacked. Well, but I don't believe you can become a good coach until you're I think not in danger of letting our standard drop a little. Comments and thinking it's all done from the wallet. That team has been neglected. It was a punch and it did look like it. I don't like that their type of operation. The game with Johnny always had to be protected. And in doing that, he would sometimes, if not often, fall out with administrators, coaches and players. And I know myself that once you are critical of players in whatever capacity, then, you know, it becomes, 
it certainly uh, creates an environment which you know has to be managed. <laughs> he will get in trouble many, many times uh, for speaking his mind uh, to the point that um, when we live in Bronte, we even got uh, death threats and a few tomatoes and a few eggs in a window and in our garden. And it wasn't just once, it was two or three times. And that put a lot of pressure on us. The pressures of his public profile led Johnny to seek much needed space. And he found it south of Sydney, in the sleepy village of Jamboree, where his brother Ross runs the local pub. There was a, a house for sale in Jamboree, which was a fantastic location. It was a, it was a place where uh, you couldn't be got at, except by telephone. And uh, he, uh, he fell in love with the place straight away. He settled in very quickly, became well liked by the locals, not because he was John Warren, the SBS commentator, but just because he was John Warren who played nine holes of golf and, and sat down out the front of the pub and had a beer with any Tom, Dick or Harry who liked to be sitting there and have a yak about anything. <laughs> 